Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear from thought leaders in a wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world, all around the globe, that almost no one knows about. This podcast will give you hope for the future and introduce you to people who are paving the way for all kinds of exciting insights and innovation for us all. So I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, founder of Ever Widening Circles. Since 2014, we've been casting a light on all kinds of insight and innovation, thought leaders from around the world with great ideas going uncelebrated. And along the way, I've been having conversations with all these amazing people. So we've started to record them and share them here with people who want to hear about the rest of the story about humanity and the world out there, which turns out to be remarkably good. Thank you for, uh, for coming along with us on this journey today. We have an amazing guest. And before we start, I want to just share a message with you um, about the need for feedback. If you're watching this podcast for the first time or, or you're a regular, there's a three or four minute survey that would really help us if you could fill it out um, at the end. And it will help us guide this whole process in a way that's the most help for you. So stick around at the end of the episode. And um, also <laughs> we've created the Conspiracy of Goodness gift basket. And there'll be some lucky winners of that if you help us with the survey, just as a big thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, let's meet our guest today. Today, we're going to talk with Dr. Tamsin Woolley Barker. Tamsin and I uh, met at a big conference in Panama about a topic that you're going to know a lot about today and be full of new notions about what's possible. Tamsin is an evolutionary biologist, and I, and I wrote this down to be able to say it right. She's a biomimicry um, expert who also does all kinds of business um, consulting and public speaking. And uh, that's how I met Tamsin. I learned about her genius at a big conference where people who are using nature as an inspiration for engineering ideas were all coming together there in Panama. So Tamsin, welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. Thank you, Linda. It's a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> now, I didn't even begin to, to, this was a tip of the iceberg introduction. Tell me more, tell us all more about the scope of your, your work and where, where, what, what were the steps that brought you to this point in, in, in your ability to share new ideas with the world? Right. Well, uh, it's kind of funny because I, uh, I'm just really obsessed with living things and I always have been. So um, I guess we were two, two, I was two years old and my parents moved uh, from Canada to San Diego and they had a little Volkswagen bug that you had to fill up with gas, every gas station. And so Arco gas stations were giving away these little animals like that go two by two into the Arc, you know? So I had this great collection of these animals um, and I was obsessed with them and learned all about them. And so that got me started learning about uh, nature. So it was really a fossil fuel company that got me on the, on the track. <laughs> uh, even more uh, um, astonishing irony at this stage of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was a huge reader, um, even really young. And I was really into uh, Jane Goodall, any kind of nature shows. Um, and I read In the Shadow of Man when I was pretty young. Um, and I was just really struck by the way that she was so humble and caring. And she just, rather than studying them in a zoo, she actually went into their world, you know? Um, yeah. and so that, that really made an impression on me. And that's really something that's, that's been the basis of my work is trying to belong, trying to listen. Well, Jane Goodall is an inspiration to all of us. If you, if you don't know about Jane, uh, just Google search her name and be, and begin to understand the world of appreciation for nature that we have now, because she was one of the pioneers that brought us all to the awareness that animals have emotional lives. And, and you have a background with studying uh, primates, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. I, I actually lived in a tent in Ethiopia studying baboons by the side of the river, so studying uh, the way that their mating systems um, affect their 
evolution. <laughs> okay. We can, we got it. We got so many rabbit holes that we could stumble down today and we're just going to try and be, um, be lovely and, and practical, which is something you do with remarkable um, regularity. How I understand your work, first of all, it's important to know that, that, um, that Tamsin has a book called Teaming, and it's a business book. It's a basic guide to how we organize business cultures in a much more sane way. But what I love about that book is the way, with the way you spelled teaming. So, oh yeah, with two E's. Because, yeah. So you, know, you, you, we, you know, we team, we want to be in teams and do good things together, but teaming is the way that the uh, creepy crawlies of the world do it. <laughs> yes. It, like the world teeming with life. That, That's right. This, That's right. It's really with play activity. on abundance, you know, oh. and life just spilling forth. And I think that's what we want. Yes. Oh, that is such a great way to say it. Okay. So Tamsin and I chatted for just a few minutes right before we started because I wanted to be, she's got so much to uh, bring to us about sort of one aha moment after the other that we can pick up from the animal world that um, that I'm just going to launch right into these topics that we touched on when we were talking and have you share some of the insights that you're finding are really working well in these complex times. So let's first start at the very top of the umbrella here. There's a, there's a, a, um, a subsection of the engineering world called biomimicry. And it may be self-evident, but give us your take on why the world should be studying nature for solutions in the engineering world and, and the whole the whole biomimicry gig. Sure. Well, I mean, we we've got our ways of dealing with the problems that we have, you know, and they, they usually take a lot of energy, a lot of resources, you know, it's pretty heavy-handed. But if you look out there, all these 30 million species or whatever have solved the same kind of problems. And all of them that are alive today are survivors, right? It's like 3.8 billion years of evolution. So we know they work, they're proven. So we can look at those strategies and you know, see what are the deep patterns there? And then we can start to apply them to our challenges. And sometimes it gives us really radically new ways to solve things that we thought we knew. Um, and it's always life-friendly because it had to evolve in life's context. That is such a great way to say it, life friendly. Okay, so give us a couple examples of uh, in engineering design in the in the world of biomimicry that some of us might know about or that might seem familiar and kind of like an aha moment. Well, yeah, okay. So it, I mean, here's the classic: is uh, George de Mistral was this guy, and he he's taking his dog for a walk, and he gets home, and it's his dog's fur is full of burrs. So he takes one off, and he looks under the microscope, and he sees, you know there's these burrs and the fur and it's like this. And he thinks, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder if I can invent something like that. So Velcro, Velcro is exactly that. Um, and so there's your biomimetic product. But now if you were a real biomimetic, you would go further into that and say, well, now is this made of plastic? How would life actually do this? Um, and so it's really, it's a recursive process that you can get deeper and deeper into uh, life-friendly design. Yeah, I, you know, and oh, that's such a great example. I, I never use that example. I always tell people about the bullet train. Oh yeah, the bullet train is amazing. <clears throat> that's in Japan and they, people were complaining that when the trains went through the, uh, the tunnels, it would make these sonic um, booms and it was really disturbing. But they found that the kingfisher dives into the, the water and hardly makes a ripple. So those sound waves um, wouldn't have that effect when you're changing mediums like that. And so they actually copied it and put it on the front of the train and lo and behold, no sonic booms. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's actually one they're using now that's been really successful, which is uh, the shark lit, which they're, um, because, you know, if you notice sharks, they don't grow barnacles and algae and things on them. They've got clean skin that allows them to move fast. So what they did was they, they looked closely at that and there's a structure to their scales that prevents things from growing on them. So they took that and they made it into sheets that they can, not shark sheets, but imitating that um, and put it on uh, hospital walls, rails, and then no bacteria can grow on it without any chemical. 
that's you know this is classic that is a classic um uh, scenario of how um how this world has this huge untapped resource in in this as you say 3.8 billion years of r d <laughs> and it's all open source it's all yes. open source <laughs> that's another that's another advantage right if we just start turning over rocks who knows what problems we can solve that's right 30 million so, answers out there absolutely okay so there's beauty in patterns and patterns of course um you know, patterns, especially patterns that are millions of years old, they indicate success. So give us some of your, your best stuff about where we start there. Well, I use patterns and pattern seeking as a real foundation for my work because, um, you know, how do organisms uh, make the decisions they make? It's because they know that, oh, if I, if that's happening, then this is likely to happen. It's that expertise for being in the world. Um, and it's really pattern recognition and humans are amazing at it, right? So good that we see patterns that aren't even there, you know, with stereotypes and, and things like that. Um, you know, and, and it, it's a huge responsibility, that talent. It's something that needs to be schooled and learned and trained. Um, so I start there. I start with getting people to notice the patterns and the relationships between organisms. Um, and I think that that is a basis that you can take anywhere in the world. I mean, we don't know what we're going to need in the future, but if we learn to read patterns and see them, I think we can be at home in the universe anywhere we are. Wow. Lovely. That's just such a lovely, I, I have to say, I, I just love these little, these little way you end sentences every once in a while. Okay. So um, you're particularly good, at least the conversations that we've had over dinner here and there, you're particularly good at looking at the insect world and making some comparisons to how we organize business. Mm. So dive into that for a few minutes for us, because most of the people that are working are, are listening to this podcast will have a, a working life and they're, they're struggling with their teams and they're, they may be teeming with problems. <laughs> Tell, give, us, give us some insights from that angle. Right, well, so, okay. So I studied baboons, right? Um, baboon behavior. And, but what I noticed was these two different species of baboons in this area had very different social systems and looked very different. And what I found was it's the way they're organized allowed one species to change very fast. So, that got me thinking, well, if we want to transform things very quickly, um, how can we mimic that uh, structure, those structures that allow change to happen quickly? Um, and collaboration actually increases with that too. So I was like, what's that about? So I started looking at that. And what I realized is that humans actually, even though we're fancy apes, um, have an ant-like social system. So I started looking at how ants organize. And um, the patterns are astonishing. Like the way they make complex things, um, it's very similar to us. And so what they do is they work in these little teams that are basically self-organizing. And these complex, amazing structures emerge from that. So I started really looking at the deep patterns of that and how we can apply them in companies and in everything we do to make it, um, more comfortable and natural for us, but also more effective. Mm -hmm. So I think you're referring to some, a sentence that I, I heard you speak in, a, in a, a YouTube video. I heard the most responsive to change survives. That's right. I mean, we have this idea, you know, I think that was Darwin that said that, you know, that it's, it's not the most intelligent or the strongest. Um, it's the most re responsive to change. And so here we are, we're talking about, you know, we are in COVID times and all these things happening. We need to change quickly. We know that we don't have the processes and structures in place to do it. Um, and so I think that's the highest leverage point. If we could get organizations to change the way they're structured um, from this mechanistic efficiency mindset to this living system, diversity honoring, um, evolving and adaptive kind of system, we could solve all our problems very quickly. Give me an example. Uh, just a, a, Do you have an anecdotal example of, of a kind of a change you've seen an organization make that relates to this? 
Yeah, I mean, here's a simple example. Um, you know, when you, you know, you, all these dyadic interactions that you have with one person all the time, um, if you switch to a triadic system where it's three of you, then you always have this built in accountability. You have built in um, when you guys are too busy to keep your relationship going, you've got this third person that holds it. So the things you do and your network is still going, even when you're not in there. So it, what it does is it increases productivity 30%, but it also increases the resilience. And so just a simple switch like that, and it takes out all of the, um, the conflicts and the gossip and all of those things because you're always accountable and you're distributing that accountability. And then too, when you need something new, you can try add in that innovation. So you can always find someone that rounds out your your trio and brings it to something novel that you hadn't thought about before. That is just so basic, but so ele elementary once you kind of give it some thought. Yeah, I think it's a good idea for a new dating system. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my honeycomb triad dating system. <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> okay, we, we won't dive that down that too far, but that does remind me of um of the fact that that most of our problems these days you like to say are because our systems don't match our nature that's right talk to me about this well here we are okay we're basically ant colonies um you know when and you think oh well ant colonies are like clone armies we're all like we don't want to be like that it's actually not true when you look at ants um researchers can't even identify them as individuals by their behavior. They're so different. So what they've done is they've gotten away they with can't, Excuse me, they, they can or they can't identify them? They can. They yeah. can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have ant researchers that have names for them all. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, you think it's a clone army, it isn't. Okay. Um, and so what they've done is they've done away with all that hierarchical management and all that planning and all of those kind of rigid roles that we have and they just said, well, you can do whatever you want. And, you know, 40% of them aren't very good at that. Um, but that's okay because they have this resilience and this redundancy built in. Um, and so I think just that simple kind of switch, that's actually the way that humans work. You know, you work that way with your friends and your family. It's very self-organized. You, you know, you we're really good at reading patterns. We're really good at deciding 30 seconds, whether we can trust someone or not. Um, and so if we were aligned around those things at work, the thing, you know, meaningful work relationships and freedom to do things the way that we see fit, um, with a process for, uh, keeping parasites and free riders in check, I think we'd be well on our way. Okay. So I'm going to write down two words, freeloaders and parasites. Cause I want to get to there. We, we, Okay. And I want to just ask if this is just so we all can take away something really practical from what you just said about how the self-organizing nature of things, if we stop micromanaging, I'm thinking of a, of a common example. We have a cabin, a family cabin back on the family farm. And when we go there, I cook for 20 to 30 people every single night. It just wow. seems that our cabin's a place where everybody's excited to come because we don't get back there very often and so forth. Okay, so after dinner, <laughs> believe me, everybody else was, was swimming and having a beer on the dock while I was cooking. I step away from the kitchen and let everyone else clean up. And I found that the more I try and micromanage that cleanup process, the more of a failure it is. <laughs> so now we just turn up the disco music as loud as we can and 15 people will self-organize into a system of cleaning up. Is, is, this, is this what you're talking about? exactly what I'm talking about. If you have a, a, a strongly shared purpose um, and, and, a, and, a, and a value of like, we want to do it in a way that um, people will go to work and, and do just fine. And it's a far more efficient. And the ants figured that out, you know, 200 million years ago. Um, and I think that we've always lived that way. And, and it's just the mismatch at work. We don't, we're not allowed to work that way. I think it's a lot of wasted potential because we can't bring our individual gifts to, to our work. 
you know, it's a it's a role. Do this the way we tell you. It's standard operating procedure. Um, and and that's not how the ants work. That is so that that's just a precious concept that um that I'm so glad you shared with us today. It'll it'll give me some real pause um when I go back into the office and try and create all these systems. <laughs> <laughs> where I've got beautiful people that I hired because of their ingeniousness, you know, that let them at, let them figure out the own, their the best way forward. Yeah, you know, Linda, I feel like all our lives we're asked, can you do this? And then you get a grade on it. But nobody ever says, what can you do? Like there's no open-endedness to this. And so all of our, our unique gifts are irrelevant. And that's the stuff that we have midlife crises over, whereas that's actually our value. That is a huge observation. That is so huge and so important to our times because it seems like the more chaos that the world goes towards, the more we is our impulse to try and to try and manage it and organize it. And yeah, and that's probably and, and exactly. Fact, you know, you hear all people, are, we, all of our endeavors, you know, we want to make an impact. We want to scale it up. Um, and, and maybe that's not the way, you know, that's, uh, uh, if you, what happens, and we've got this, this efficiency paradigm on everything, right? There's a, you know, we, lean six sigma or whatever it is. Like we go to this one point of perfection, but then when conditions change and you scale it up to that one point, conditions change and you've lost all the diversity you need. That's the raw feedstock of that adaptation. So no wonder we're all miserable. <laughs> that is so brilliant. All right. I'm going to really give that a thought going forward. Cause I know a lot of people that listen to this podcast are business people and they're innovators. We have um, just started something we call the conspiracy of goodness network. And mm. um, this is a place where people who want to do good in the world, who want to make the world a better place, can come together with all, all those mean people who are shouting at each other and be multipliers for each other's ideas and good intention and all that. And it seems like this is a concept that would be so precious to have stumbled upon when you're at that startup phase where you're going to hire your first three or four people. Whoa. If you went yeah. to all that trouble to hire yeah. really good and genius people, then let them go. Yeah. yeah. And then it goes, what goes with that though, is that you need a process for pulling out shared purpose mm -hmm. um, and, and values. You can start with that. So we don't have that process either. So, um, you know, it's uh, take a lesson from the ant. So that's what makes it work in the ant, in the ant hill. They, everyone's shared purpose is carefully hardwired, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's protect that queen and her, um, she's the one making wealth for the colony. So protect her and, and help her out. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Now <laughs> I'm just going to talk, uh, talk Turkey here. The reason why a lot of business leaders, I'm pretty sure, and a lot of team leaders and supervisors, um, would probably bristle at the part of the conversation we're in right now is because we're afraid of the freeloaders and the parasites. Parasites. So, because there is always somebody who ruins it for everybody. So, yeah. tell us how the freeloaders and the parasites work into this whole scenario. Yeah. I mean, there's, if you look, I, it's 85% people are playing the tit for tat game, which is, you know, we just take care of each other and as long as, long as you don't screw up. Um, but then you got 15% of the population are playing a winner take all game. Um, and it's an actual different strategy. And so that's why when you meet these narcissistic people, you don't get anywhere with them because they're actually playing a different game. Um, and that you, is you can mathematically model it and you can see that it oscillates. So it goes from 85% cheats to 85% um, cooperators. Um, and these are like, they go through our societies in these rippling ways. So you can't, it's very hard to be good and cooperative in a cheating society because you'll be taken advantage of. Um, and the flip is true as well, that cooperators do better in a cheating society because they stick together. 
So you could actually use these dynamics in a purposeful way. Um, and what they find is that the way that humans are structured, we like to work in groups of about 150. And at that level, we are very good at distributing accountability and seeing freeloaders and, and checking them. Um, and we don't have any of that in our current society because you outsource it to the police, you outsource it to HR. Um, it's not something that we take on. And what happens is that dominance and, um, and social deception flourishes under those conditions. Okay. So <laughs> now we're getting around to something that I talk a lot about is, is, um, is this way that the internet has changed our social structures mm -hmm. in a way that's become so frustrating for many of us. Mm -hmm. There's just too much negative noise mm -hmm. to even think straight. Some days I feel like, uh, I feel like we're all being asked to think straight in a room where the fire alarm is blaring. Oh yes. So we were talking about before the break was this concept that we've lost some of the, some of the um, built-in <laughs> stops and breaks and correct cor correction systems that would keep everybody from being nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what, the, the analogy I always use is um, what happened with the internet and social media in particular is like this. So 40,000 years ago, we started organizing in, in small bands of people and sitting around a campfire and you can just fire off whatever you wanted to say, because if you did, you might have to sleep with one eye open indefinitely. I mean, back then somebody could just take a big rock and knock you in the head while you were sleeping and it's game over. So there were some, there were some, there were some consequences to not being helpful and thoughtful, but the internet has completely taken the brakes off of everyone's um, self-regulation. And I'm sure you've got some things to say about that. Tell us, tell us where that, those notions take your mind. Yeah, I mean, the internet, well, I mean, what I, as an ant, like, okay, if you run the ant program forward, you get something, I mean, an evolutionary biologist would never say that, but I'm gonna say it. Um, you would get something like uh, the, uh, the mycelium underground, which I don't know if you know, but like mushrooms that we see, that's just the fruit of the mycelium. It's an, basically an internet underground. It's like an underground brain for the whole planet. Um, and so, yeah. This well, let me just do yeah. an ordinary per person explanation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if you want to know more about this, you can go to a fabulous article at Ever Widening Circles, the website that, that we, where we publish all these articles about insight and innovation. I think that article is called The Wood Wide Web. <laughs> and the deal is, is that scientists have discovered that trees are actually communicating with each other through an underground network of little like filament, f filaments that are um, the underground, the, the body of mushroom societies. And like Tamsin said, the, what we see of a mushroom is just the, like the flower, yeah. or like the, up, the upstairs part. But the downstairs turns out to be a, a communication conveyor belt of chemicals. And so, okay, carry on. Yeah, so they're shuttling water and sugars and round. And actually they're supporting 95% of the plants on earth. So they are, they've run this program to a point where they can support all life on earth. Um, and so I, I see that, that parallel, it's convergence uh, with the human internet. It looks just like the mycelium. It's a similar kind of thing with the density and the networking and the connections. Um, and so I think, well, why couldn't it support um, the ecosystems that we depend on um, in the future? I don't see, you know, why it couldn't fill that. So then you start looking at, well, why is it not doing that? Um, and then you can look at the logic of ownership of nodes and, and things like that. But basically we don't have that distributed accountability within it right now because we don't share a, uh, share a purpose. You know, okay. people on the internet, they have their own purposes and here we are interacting. So in the mycelial world, we would, they would, think of that as parasitism. Some other organism is coming to share our cell walls 
and our DNA and our nutrients and all that, but they don't share our purpose. So that's a parasite. We exclude them. So here we are, we're trying to scale up these global things and they are not organized around shared purpose and they never really can be. All right. So that, that is the, that is at the heart of something that I speak to people all over the world about. I'm very, um, very motivated to help the world open a new era by reimagining the role of the internet in our lives. I mean, really the bottom line is the internet was, is a human construct. It's nothing more than that. Just like the cotton gin or the, you know, the steam engine or the printing press. And with every single great human leap uh, of innovation, you know, we live with it for a while and we realize that it's doing good things over here, but dreadful things over there. And we reimagine it. And when you really think about the internet, it, it's got a terrible organizing principle. I mean, we went from 130 websites in, in uh, 1993 to 40 million in 2003. So in 10 years, and no one could get their arms around it. So the organizing principle became our attention. The yeah. organizing principle became capturing our attention any way possible. And I'm sure there's some evolutionary comments you could make about, um, about what happened there. You know, mm-hmm. now people are just trying to capture our attention by being the most bizarre or the most nasty or the most angry or mean or threatening. Right. Um, so I, I really think that you, you've probably looked hard and long enough at primate communities, insect communities. What's, what's a, <laughs> if we could just like go wild and reimagine an organizing principle for, for the internet? Yeah. Um, would it have to include some measure of, of notions about the greater good, a shared purpose? I think you would organize it around shared purposes. And I think that you would organize it in groups of 150. Uh-huh. So, and they could overlap. Um, you know, we all have different interests and different goals and that can overlap. But I think that the networks have got to be um, maybe li- list, li- limited to 150. So that we can have enough trust and knowledge of one another um, to do that. And I also think you'd want to distribute the accountability. So when you see nastiness or um, falsities, you just ping them and okay. that's distributed. And so, you know, maybe that's not censorship, but maybe it lowers your connectivity score or something like that. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So people always ask me when I'm, reimagining uh, they always say oh you're talking about censorship and I always say no well how about self-censorship how about <laughs> if we all just didn't spout off the first thing that comes to mind I know that my first thoughts are not that good <laughs> and uh, I what you know what's going on in nature that we can learn from because I think what you're saying about accountability is probably where we're going with this opening a new of a new era. We're going to start rewarding people that we're we're grateful for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, that that's going to happen. Um, I mean, when you're when you're looking out in when you're out in the wild, you see how animals are. Uh, they're not just out there blathering. They're they're quiet. They're looking. They're listening. They're looking at the patterns before they blunder into them, because there's consequences to it. No, you might get eaten. Um, I think there should be a little bit more lions on the internet. (laughs) People (laughs) would just say, "Yeah, yeah." We just did an article on the painted dogs of Africa and how this, yeah, this huge national park was not thriving. It's called Gorongosa. After decades of war, they tried to re reintroduce wildlife and the, um, the herbivores were going wild and way out balancing the uh, environment. And then when they put the painted dogs there, a little bit, a little bit of, of pushback. Um, yeah. Yeah. All the difference. Think about that a lot. I mean, you probably, a lot of your listeners are going to be familiar with the, when they int- reintroduced the wolves in Yellowstone and it changed right. rivers in ways that were unexpected. Um, and I think about, you know, and the reason was that the deer were not moving. They were staying in the valleys and they were overeating. And so the wolves just kept them on the move. Um, and so then I think about 
what we're dealing with in our lives and overuse and scarcity and um and i think gosh what we need is some wolves <laughs> but i think of course that's each other <laughs> So, so when I hear you say that, or when I think of this, this relationship we were talking about here, is this, when, is this somebody, is this just someone who will, you know, more of us hit, hit, um, unfollow. (laughs) Is that the, I think that's the wolf mentality is that we just disconnect from people who are bringing us down, who are adding to the noise and the chaos. Well, no, I mean, I, I was thinking more about keeping people on the move, nipping at their heels, ah. Ah, <laughs> okay. hating them, but you know, just, just check your manner here. Okay. You've been grazing here too long, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is, uh, the, uh, you know, how people, um, how people, uh, navigate what we're talking about here in their own lives. I, I'd love to hear from people. If, if you're out there and Tamsin and I are really out on the fringes of ideas here, but if, if any of this um, gives you a good idea about how to make things work in your office space or your family, we're just throwing stuff out here. That's well, um, it's not so far fetched. We, we, um, one of the things is uh, the honeybee democracy. I don't know if you know about that. No, tell us about the honeybee democracy. Well, here's how we, I mean, we make all our decisions, you know, voting for presidents and all that entails, but the way the bees do it, when they need to find a new home, all the scouts go out in different directions and go explore. And when they find places, they go check them out. And then they come back and if it's good, they do this waggle dance, this little figure eight dance. And if they like it a lot, they'll do more dances and they'll do it more vigorously. So other um, bees see that dance. And if it's a good dance, they'll go, hey, I think I'm gonna go check it out myself. So out they go, but nobody will vote for it without seeing it. There's no sharing the post without reading it. So (laughs) the bees come back, they do their dance, more bees see that. So the good spots start to amplify and the poorer ones start to fade away. And at some point there's a threshold that they cross. Enough bees are doing the same dance that it just triggers the whole hive to fly to the new location. And the weird thing is it's always the best one. Um, They found that they actually always do choose the best site. And so I'm like, well, why don't we uh, vote for presidents like that? You know, it's our little waggle dances. <laughs> well, in a way, it's, it's, it's very akin to, um, I give people these four shifts that they can do to start seeing a more positive world in the screens in their lives. And the first one's pause. Pause before just clicking on anything. Pause. The second one's ignore more. The third one's seek signs of goodness and progress, which is what you're suggesting the bees do. They all go out and they seek it. And then share it is my fourth one. We need to share signs of goodness and progress. And I think that that's probably just right in the wheelhouse of what you were saying. Yeah, and honest, transparent sharing. Um, And then just a competition of ideas, of honest ideas and the best ones. But the other thing is that what I like about that system is that it allows for a diversity of possibilities. There Mm -hmm. might be 20 different dances going on. Like, um, yeah, so so there is this real um, diversity of possibilities is the raw feedstock of all this. And uh, and so we have to have mechanisms for bringing that out. Oh, that is just brilliant. I love this. I can imagine you advising um, business and industry from this angle. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. Oh, I had one with a, <laughs> I had one with a very large company and I'm just going into my slime mold routine and they were just going. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes the slime mold doesn't play in the corporate real world, but, but you'd be surprised how often it does. <laughs> Oh, the slime mold. We have a recent article on slime mold that'll put you on your ear far, as far as possibility goes too. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Oh, okay. So one of the things I wanted to get your opinion on is <laughs> what do we do about all the bad news? What? <laughs> how does bad news work into all this? Well, to be honest for myself, I just don't consume any. Um, I just, I mean, I am just focused on my purpose and I look for people that share that purpose 
and I focus entirely on that. Mm -hmm. um, I do read the headlines so I know what's going on and I will read in depth um, things on, on things I'm interested in. But I, what I found is that that constant bad news. I um, mean, there's always bad news going on somewhere in the world. So if you're watching na international news, you're getting bombarded with it. But the reality is that when you go for a walk in your neighborhood, it's pretty nice and the birds are singing. <laughs> so I just try to stay in my 150 people and in my what I can control. And I think a lot about my sphere of influence um, and my sphere of concern and making those match. Um, okay. That's very interesting. I, I, I want to go back to that, that okay. your 150 people, because this is where we go wrong with the, with the, all the bad news. Hmm. It is that, um, you know, when the, when all the forest fires were burning out in the West and, and I live in Vermont and, and that we were having a horrible hurricane season in the Southern United States, I wrote an op-ed um, about the fact that you know, if the fire, the flames are not licking your door and the water isn't rising under the floorboards, then stay on your feet because you're a lot more useful to your neighbors. And you can actually be more help to faraway places if we stay on our feet and we don't let all this doom and gloom yeah. suck us down too. We, we can care deeply about these other places and be useful. We can send money to the Red Cross. We can send our, our old clothes. We can call up a, a local shelter and ask them what they need and send them a box of cleaning supplies. Um, but not if we let all this doom and gloom take us down too. Yeah. And what I, what, what they've shown and what I've personally experienced is when you let that get to you, you, it, it, it affects your ability to be creative. It affects your ability to think big picture and it affects your ability to care um, and so it really erodes your ability to do anything about it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So is there some bi biology to that? Like we can only yeah. care about so many people and then we just hit the overload button and we check out or what's going you, on there? You flip into fight or flight. I mean, then it's our reptilian brains and we're just going, oh, I just got to survive and avoid the predator. You can't think about the larger picture and the larger system and where the leverage points might be. And um, you, you just, you know, you become the hunted instead of the hunter. Uh, mm. it's all oh. fades. That is so huge. That's exactly right. So talk to me more about the leverage, seeing the leverage points. That is a, I, I have, an, I have a thought that that's a very important notion that we all need to know more about. Like, how do we see the leverage points in our life? Maybe give you some examples in business or personal life. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's really important to me. Like, I, I have a vast array of undertakings that I do. And a lot of people are like, well, how does all this fit together? Like, how do you even make sense of it all? But I'm like, it's really just one thing. Because, you know, what I'm trying to do is um, create this ecosystem, this, this kind of unified theory of where we are animals and, and understanding what we're doing from the animal perspective. Tamsin, before we dive down that rabbit hole, let's, let's, I would love to hear your thoughts about our animal nature versus our human nature. Because, you know, you mentioned a middle, minute ago our lizard brain, which I speak to people a lot about and how that, that fight or flight part of our brain is constantly on and we follow those impulses so often over a cliff. Where's the beauty in human nature and, and how do we bring that to the surface these days? Oh, I'm glad you asked that because I kind of, I'm partial to uh, our species. Um, but like, so as being a, a primatologist, you know, I wanted to study the, the nature of humans. So I thought, mm, okay, I'll study our closest relatives, and we have chimpanzees. So I've spent a lot of time studying primates, like, like those apes. Um, and what I realized in that process is that, yes, we share 98% of our DNA with them and we have empathy and imagination and all the things that they have, the creativity, but the main difference is we have a totally different social system that is ant-like. And what that means is that we are unique 
in, as individuals, um, but we share all that with one another for a shared purpose. So humans actually are very different um, than uh, uh, most other animals. Very rare to have a, that super organism um, society. And so I think, I feel like we have this narrative of uh, nature red and tooth and claw and survival of the fittest. Um, whereas it doesn't really apply to humans very well because we're super organisms. So we are not competing against one another. If we're competing, it's to be trusted. Um, you know, and so it, it uh, um, all these kinds of co social Darwinian constructs that we're working off are not applicable. And even there, when you're looking at other animals, it doesn't apply because everything is connected. So, you know, even if you have a parasite, like there's a mistletoe that, that uh, sucks all the juice out of, you know, some trees in the desert, and it's always been a parasitic relationship, but it turns out there's a special bird that eats the um, little berries from the mistletoe and then, you know, sprouts those seeds and fertilizes the tree. And it's the three of them are together creating abundance. So um, just a lot of our constructs about, about nature, red and tooth and claw are just not correct and definitely not for humans because we're super organisms. That is, that is just such a great way of thinking about it. And it goes back, to, I, I love this. If we're competing, it is to be trusted. Yeah. <sighs> so <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. That is so true in our families, in our working places and so forth. I love that. And, and there's, a, there's a downside to that. And then a, of course, a positive side. And it goes back to the question that I kind of, spun away from for a second because I knew you would say something lovely like that. Um, so this, this 150 people number, I've heard that before too. I, I do a lot of reflection about, you know, what would people in the stone age have done? Because that's where we come from. We, yeah. lots of our social constructs started then and we've gotten far away. So, so this, this worried of worrying about the other out there on social media, countless people whose lives look perfect on social media and mm -hmm. ours isn't right <laughs> yeah kind of nutty right there um yeah. because social media is just comparison without context but if we stick in our little 150 people circles we know when somebody's got a big day that maybe their dog got hit by a car yesterday and we're we're happy for them that they can find find solace today. I mean, talk to me more about this 150 people and maybe that's a solution to our, to our social media quandary. Yeah. Well, that, that number came out of, um, I used to, you know, I studied baboons. So there's these geladas, it's a special kind of baboon and they're very chatty. They're the chattiest of all the primates, except for us. Spend all day singing and chatting to one another. And they also live in the biggest societies. They live in these like 400, individual groups. Um, so the only society of uh, primates that live in a bigger society is us. So um, two interesting parallels. But what it turns out is that they're, they're grass eaters. So they have to spend all day picking grass, eating it. So their solution to being able to, they, they can't groom. Grooming is how primates make their relationships. So they don't have enough time to do that. So what they've done is use their vo voices to make friends with more than one at a time. So it's a, and, and that's how vocal, um, that vocalness has evolved. And it's the same for us. So we are talking all the time and it's really like grooming. It's like grooming on steroids for us. So, um, but the thing is, is that the size of our brain expands with the big, the size of our group to maintain the politics of all those different individuals and the ability to talk to them all. And we maxed out. I mean, we can't even get out of the birth canal anymore. Like we've got these things. Um, so we, we're topped out there. <laughs> so, so what can we do? You know, it's, it's now we're kicking into these um, things, but 150 individuals seems to be the, uh, the maximum number that we can 
maintain relationships with um, and trust. And do you think there's a practical tip there for how we um, navigate our, our work environments or, our, or for that matter, our social media or the news or, or let's say our incoming information? Absolutely. I think it should all be arranged around that. I think there should be local patches. That's how evolution occurs. It doesn't occur globally. Like all this global scale up with best practices um, just erases all the diversity and homogenizes it. So you're really losing a lot of potential there. Okay. Give me a little bit more practical insight on what you just said. So like here are these companies, you know, they're global. Um, and so they come up with these best practices that are the most efficient and then they impose that um, all around the world and okay. better somewhere here and not there, but everywhere is so unique. You've got different people and different populations. And so if there's a way that we can be um, grouped into patches or group ourselves into patches, and I think of mycelial patches like the fungus, they work in patches like this as well. Um, because then, you know, you can share the costs and benefits, and you have the trust that's distributed, um, and you can work on shared purpose in that. And yes, they are all connected and linked and nested, but um, we have those safeguards in place. Um, and it also allows adaptation to occur faster because every it, location can evolve its own way. All right, what I think you're talking about is neighborhoods and small communities of people, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. This, we don't have to like really go way out there. We can just say, hey, do the right thing in your neighborhood. We Help. got so high tech that we just invented the neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, this is it. I look around my town um, and I say, oh my God, they, they're just today, there's a fundraiser going on and they're going to raise like $330,000 for a new teen center. And we need it so bad. Our little town needs it so bad. I mean, help <laughs> do what you can with what you have right in your own neighborhood and there's your 150 people right yeah 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 and yeah. But it also goes beyond that I mean we can have virtual communities of 150 as well yes. I mean to, my, to be honest my 150 people are all over the world but yes. they're still my community um and I think we can have both they can overlap Oh, that is okay. So this is the, you know, this is what I would love for um, what I know I'm going to take away from this conversation is that we need to, we need to know enough about what's happening outside our neighborhood and our, our communities. And our, when, I, when I say communities, I, I mean, even communities on the internet, groups that love Britney Spaniels or groups that love to cook, you know, a certain ethnic food or whatever, all the millions of small communities there are on the internet. Um, but that's where we can find the stuff that's, that makes us soar. And we've got to stop uh, giving our attention to all the, 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 the extraneous negative noise that's way outside our circle of 150. Yeah. I mean, I just think there has to be so much more structure. And yeah. when, I say, when I say structure, I mean, differ, like who we associate with, like right. we need to be more intentional about it. Yes. Oh, it's lovely. I, we could go on and on. We only got to page one of the notes. I took. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to do this again. I'm just, I didn't even get to the bonobo mating habits. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, that's worth part B and everyone will remember that, that notion will hang on their uh, top of mind, bonobo mating habits. Okay. <laughs> So tell us where people can connect with your work. Cause we, we didn't even talk about the ranch. And oh, yeah. So many endeavors. I mean, I really do. And, and I, what I'm really working on is a unified field of everything we do based on evolutionary thinking. So from what you do on your daily basis, all the way through your workplace to the circular economy and to the bigger things that we're trying to do in the world. So if you want to look, find out more about that, I would say, my book, Teeming, is fantastic. I like it. Um, I love it. Thank you. And I have another one coming out that's more applied, a little less philosophical and a little more how-to. Um, and then I've got my team innovation group, which works with like a Fortune 500 um, clientele. We work on structure and process um, and reinventing that 
for agility and resilience and um, diversity and all the things that companies are looking for. Um, and then I've got my uh, rehumanization efforts, which um, circle around geoversity, which is in Panama, and we're um, working on biocultural renewal. So how can people reconnect to their place and learn how to um, support those places? And then we're doing a similar thing at the Borrego Institute for Living Design. Like what, what can we make together and how, and how can we kind of come home again to the land? And how can we start to think about all these things we're doing from a more living perspective? Um, and so that's really the, the work that I'm working on. Um, teaminnovationgroup.com has a lot of this on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're welcome to connect to any of my social media. We're doing a lot of interesting things. Um, and I think we got a lot of good stuff in the pipeline. Oh, this is so lovely. Now, everything that Tamsin just mentioned, there's going to be links in the show notes too. So you don't have to work for any of this. We have the most incredible podcast producers and they'll make sure all that's in the, in the show notes. So I always like to end by asking my guests, you know, um, at everwideningcircles.com, the mothership of, of all the endeavors I'm doing to make the world a better place. Um, our, our second line, it's ever widening circles. It is still an amazing world. Do you have anything that's top of mind when I say, what proves to you that it's still an amazing world? Oh, well, how could you ever doubt that? Um, <laughs> it's it's just the, the amazing diversity of, of beings and relationships and connections and it's increasing every day, right? It's uh, uh, emerging wider around us. And so that ever widening circles to me really responds because I'm trying, the, th the seeds that we're planting as individuals, you know, we wanna make an impact on the world and we wanna affect those wider circles. And so um, that has a big, that, that resonates for me. Great. Little stories and wider arcs of impact. That's lovely. Well, thank you so much for being our guest, Tamsin. I, 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 I'm going to get a second chance to listen to this, um, this podcast when I look through it for edits. And I know <laughs> I will have such a great time walk, writing down some of these great phrases that you use that remind me of the beauty that's out in the world in 3.8 billion years of research and development. Thank you. It gives me so much hope every day waking up, just hearing the birds and knowing that all these things have their own lives and it's not just about us. Uh, it's not just about us. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'll close today's episode with a few comments that, um, that I hope you can help me with. Uh, people ask us every day at Everwinding Circles and the Conspiracy of Goodness, how they can help. Because we are really working hard to open a new era for us all and leave all this negative noise and chaos and division behind. So the first thing you can do is go and rate this podcast for us, review and rate it. You know, we're currently in the top 25% of podcasts in the world. Imagine a world where we were in the top 5% or the top 1% with conversations like this. Um, I have talked to thought leaders every week from, talk about diversity. <laughs> such amazing backgrounds and they bring the kind of aha moments that you can use throughout your day um and if you can review and rate us um on on your favorite podcast system the apple podcast rating system really helps us in particular um that would be a great help the the more we get the word out that the world is full of possibility the more we can open that new era for us all and thank you for listening. And remember to fill out the survey I mentioned at the, at the opening. That is so helpful too. We'll move things in whatever direction seems thoughtful and helpful to you. Um, there's three lucky winners that'll receive this ever winding circles care package, we call it, that includes a, a signed copy of my book, um, the Conspiracy of Goodness tote bag, which I am very proud to carry around with me. People ask me about it all the time. Um, oh, two tickets to our October 2nd annual Conspiracy of Goodness Summit and a quart of maple syrup from our farm, from this farm right outside this window. 
<laughs> this is the real stuff. This is still fired over a wood stove, our, our wood, uh, wood boiler by our neighbors. So thank you. Fill out the survey. Your name will go in this, um, in this drawing for those, those baskets. And thanks to our affiliate partners for uh, proving that is still an amazing world as well. You can click in the show notes. Um, and if you use those links, we'll, it'll help us fund this project. And remember to check out the Conspiracy of Goodness Network. That's where people are who are coming together. We're all just like little points of light in the darkness until we combine, like Tamsin says, until, until we are that goodness is teeming with life. Thank you so much. As always, dive into everwideningcircles.com for your daily dose of, of good news. <laughs> No politics and no commercialism. That's rare. Okay, have a great day. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.